Chapter 11 The paper wing sat on a jury-rigged platform of freshly sawn pine planks, teetering out over in the eastern wall. Six sendings clustered around the craft, readying it for flight. Sabriel looked up at it as she climbed the stairs, an unpleasant feeling rising with her. She had been expecting something similar to an aircraft that had begun to be common in Encelstier. Like the biplane that had performed aerobatics at the last Waverly College open day. Something with two wings, rigging, and a propeller, though she had assumed a magical engine rather than a mechanical one. But the paper wing didn't look anything like an Encelstierian airplane. It, mostly, it most closely resembled a canoe with hawk wings and a tail. On closer inspection, Sabriel saw that it, the, central, the central fuselage was probably based on a canoe. It, ha, it was tampered at each end and had a center hole for a cockpit. Wings sprouted on each side of this canoe shape, long, swept-back wings that looked very flimsy. The wedge-shaped tail didn't look much better. Sabriel climbed the f last few steps with sinking expectations. The construction material was now clear. It was the craft's name. The whole thing was made up of, from many sheets of paper bonded together with some sort of laminate, painted powder blue with silver bands around the fuselage and silver stripes along the wings and tail. It looked pretty, decorative, and not at all airworthy. Only the yellow falcon eyes painted on its pointed brow hinted at its capacity for flight. Sabriel looked at the paper wing now, and then out at the waterfall beyond. Now, fed by floodwaters, it looked even more frightening than usual. Sp spray exploded for tens of yards above its lip. A roaring mist of paper wing, the paper wing would have to fly through before it reached the open sky beyond. Sabriel didn't even know if, it's, if it was waterproof. How often was this thing flown before? she asked nervously. Intellectually, she crafted, or intellectually, she accepted that she would soon be sitting in the craft to be launched out towards the crashing waters, but her subconscious and her stomach seemed very keen on stay firm, to stay firmly on the ground. Many times, replied Moggett, easily jumping from the platform to the cockpit. His voice echoed there for a moment, till he climbed back up, furry face, cat face propped on the rim. The abhorson who made it once flew it to, a, to the sea and back in a single afternoon, but she was a great weather witch and could work the winds, I don't suppose. No, she said made aware of another gap in her education. She knew that wind magic was largely whistled charter marks, but that was all. No, I can't. Well, continued Moggett, after a thoughtful pause, the paper wing does have some elementary charms to ride the wind. You'll have to whistle them, though. You can whistle, I trust. Sabru ignored him. All necromancers had to be musical, had to be able to whistle, to hum, to sing. If they were caught in death without bells or another magical or other magical instruments, their vocal skills were the weapon of last resource. Recourse. A sending came and took her pack, 
helping her to wrestle it off, then stowing it in the rear of the cockpit. Another took Sabriel's arm and directed her to what appeared to be a leather half hammock strung across the cockpit, obviously the pilot's seat. It looked it didn't look terribly safe either, but Sabriel forced herself to climb in after giving her scalbard sword into the hands of yet another sending. Surprisingly, her feet didn't go through the paper laminated floor. The material even felt surprisingly solid, and after a minute of squirming, swaying, and adjustment, the hammock seat was very comfortable. The sword and scalbard were slid into a receptacle receptacle at the, her side and Maggot took up a position on top of the straps holding her backpack holding down her backpack just behind her shoulders for the seat made her recline so far she was almost laying down from her new eye level Sabriel saw a small oval mirror of silvered glass fixed just below the cockpit rim. It glittered at the late afternoon sun, and she felt it resonate mm -hmm, with charter magic. Resonate with charter magic. Something about it prompted her to breathe upon it, her hot breath clouding the glass. It stayed misted for a moment, then a charter mark slowly appeared as if a ghostly finger was drawn across the clouded mirror. Sabriel studied it carefully, absorbing its purpose and effect. It told her of the marks that would follow, marks to raise the lifting winds, marks for descending in haste, marks to call the wind from every corner of the compass rose. There were other marks from the paper wing, and Sabriel absorbed them. She saw that the whole craft was lined with charter magic infused with spells. The abhorson who made it had labored long and with love to create something that was more like a magical bird than an aircraft. Time passed, and the last mark faded. The mirror cleared to be only the mirror cleared to be only a plate of silver glass shimmering in the sun. Sabriel sat, silent, fixing the charter marks in her memory, marveling at the power and the skill that had made the paper wing and had thought of this method of instruction. Perhaps one day she too would have to have the mastery to create such a thing. The abhorson who made this, Sabriel asked, who was she? I mean, in relation to me. A cousin, purred Moggett, close to her ear. Your great, 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 great grandmother's cousin. The last of that line. She had no children. Maybe the paper wing was her child, Sabriel thought running her hand along the sleek surface of the fuselage. Feeling the charter marks quiet scent on in the fabric, she felt a lot better about their forthcoming flight. We'd best hurry, Moggett continued. <clears throat> We'd best hurry, Moggett continued. It will be dark all too soon. Do you have the marks remembered? Yes. Oh, yes, replied Sabriel firmly. She turned to the sendings, who were now lined up behind the wings, anchoring the paper wing till it was time for it to be unleashed upon the sky. Sabriel wondered how many times they'd perform this task, and for how many abhorsons. Thank you, 
she said to them, for all your care and kindness. Goodbye. With that last word, she settled back in the hammock seat, gripped the rim of the cockpit, cockpit with both hands, and whistled the notes of the lifting winds, visualizing the request, requisite string of charter marks in her mind, letting them drip down into her throat and lips and out into the air. Her whistle cleared, sounded clear and true, and a wind rose behind to match it, growing stronger as Sabriel exhaled. Then, with a new breath, she changed to a merry, jolliest, joyous trill, like a bird revealing to f in flight the charter marks flowing from her perch, pursed lips out into the paper wing itself. With this whistling, the blue and silver paint seemed to come alive, dancing down the fuselage, sweeping across the winds, a gleaming, lustrous plumage. The whole sh sh craft shook and shuddered, suddenly flexible and eager to begin. The joyous trail ended with one single long clear note and a charter mark that shone like the sun. It danced in the paper wing's prow and sank into the laminate. A few second, a second later, the yellow eyes blinked, grew fierce and proud, looking up to the sky ahead. The sendings were struggling now, barely able to hold the paper wing back. The lifting wind grew stronger still. Plucking at the silver-blue plumage, thrusting it forward, Sabriel began to. F Sabriel felt the paper wing's tension, the contained power in its wings, the ex exhilaration of the last moment when freedom is assured. Let go! She cried, and the sendings complied. The paper wing leaped up into the air, into the arms of the wind, and out and up upwards splashing through the spray of the waterfall as if it were no more than a spring shower flying out into the sky and the broad valley beyond. It was quiet and cold a thousand feet or more above the valley. <clears throat> the paper wing soared easily, the wind firm behind it. The clear sky above save for the faintest wisp of cloud. Sabriel reclined in her hammock seat, relaxing, running the charter marks she leaned over and over in her mind, making sure she had them properly pigeonholed. She felt free and somehow clean, as if the daggers of the last few days were dirt, washed away by the flowing following wind. Turn more to the north, Maggot's voice sudden, suddenly said behind her, disturbing her carefree mood. Do you recall the map? Yes, replied Sabriel. Shall we follow the river? The Ratterlin, it's called, isn't it? It runs north nor nor east most of the time. Moggett didn't reply at once, though Sabriel heard his purring breath be close by. He seemed to be thinking. Finally, he said, Why not? We may as well follow it to the sea. It branches it into the delta. There. So we can find an island to camp on tonight. Why not just fly on? asked Sabriel cheerily. We could be in Belshire, but. No, we could be in Belshire by tomorrow night, if I summon the strongest winds. The paper wing does not fly at night, Moggett said shortly. Not to mention that you would almost certainly lose control of the stronger winds. 
it is much more difficult than it seems at first. And the paper wing is much too conspicuous anyway. Have you no common sense, Abhorson? Call me Sabriel, Sabriel replied equally shortly. My father is Abhorson. As you wish, mistress, Moggett said. The mistress sounded extremely sarcastic. The next hour passed in belligerent silence. But Sabriel, for her part, soon lost her anger in the novelty of flight. She loved the scale of it all, to see the tiny patchwork fields and forests below, the dark strip of the river and occasional tiny building. Everything was so small and seemed so perfect, seen from afar. Then the sun began to sink, and though the red wash and through the red wash of its fading light made an aerial perspective even prettier. Sabriel felt the paper wing's desire to des descend, felt the yellow eyes focusing on green earth rather than blue sky. As the shadows l lengthened, Sabriel felt that same desire and began to look as well. The river was already breaking up into the myriad streams and rivulets that would form the swampy Ratterland Delta and far off. Sabriel could see the dark bulk of the sea. There were many islands in the Delta, some as large as football fields, covered with trees and shrubs others no bigger than two arm spans of mud. Sabriel picked out one of the medium-sized ones, a flattenish diamond with low yellow grass a few, leagues a, a few leagues ahead. She whistled down the wind. It faded gradually with her whistle, and the paper wing began to descend, occasionally nudged this way or that by Sabriel's control of the wind and its own tilt of the wing. Its yellow eyes and Sabriel's brown eyes, dark, deep brown eyes, were fixed on the ground below. Only Moggett, being Moggett, looked behind them and above. Even so, he didn't see their pursuers until they came wheeling out of the sky. So his yowling cry gave only a second warning, a few seconds warning. Just long enough for Sabriel to turn and see the hundreds of fast-moving shapes diving down upon them. Mm. <laughs> Instinctively, she conjured charter marks in her mind, mouth pursed, whistling the wind back up, turning them to the north. Gore crows, hissed Moggett, as the, pers as the flapping shapes checked their dive and wheeled a pursue that suddenly enlivened prey. Yes, shouted Sabriel, though she wasn't sure why she answered. Her attention was all on the gore crows, trying to gauge whether they'd intercept or not. She could already feel the wind testing the edges of her control, as Moggett had prophesied, and it would whip up further, might have unpleasant results. But she could also feel the presence of the gore crows, feel the admixture of death and free magic that gave life to their rotten skeletal forms. Gore crows didn't last very long in the sun and wind. These must have been May the previous night. A necromancer has trapped quite ordinary crows, killing them with ritual and ceremony before infusing the bodies with the broken, fragmented spirit of, the, of a single dead man or woman. Now they had truly carrion birds 
birds guided by a single or stupid intelligence. They flew by force of free magic and killed by force of numbers. Despite their quickness in calling the wind, the flock was still closing rapidly. They dived from high above and kept their speed. The wind stripped, stripping feathers and putrid flesh from their spell-woven bones. Bones, bones. For a moment, Sabriel considered turning the paper wing back into the very center of this great murder of crows, like an avenging angel armed with sword and bells. But there were simply too many gore crows to fight, particularly from an aircraft speeding along several hundred feet above the ground. One over, one over eager sword thrust would mean a fatal fall if the gore crows didn't kill her on the way down. I'll have to summon a greater wind, she yelled at Moggett, who was now sitting up on her pack, fur bristling, yowling challenges at the crows. They were very close now, flying in an eerily exact formation. Two long lines like arms outstretched to snatch the fleeing paper wing from the sky. Very little of their once black plumage had survived their rushing dive. White bone shining through in, what, in the last light of the sun, but their beaks were the, still glossy black and gleaming sharp and Sabriel could now see that the red glints of their fragmented dead spirit in their empty sockets of their eyes. Moggett didn't reply. Possibly he hadn't even heard her above the yowling, or his yowling, and the gore crows cawing as they closed in the last few yards to attack. A strange hollow sound as dead as their flesh. For a second of panic, Sabriel felt her dry lips unable to purse. She then wet them and, and the whistle came, slow and erratic. The charter marks felt clumsy and difficult in her head, as if she were trying to push a heavy weight on badly ro made rollers. Then, with the, a last effort, they came easily, flowing into her whistled, flowing into her whistled notes. Unlike her earlier, gradual summonings, this wind came with. Came with this, with the speed of a slamming door, howling up, behind them, with frightening violence, picking up the paper wing and shunting it forward like a great wave lifting up a slender boat. Suddenly, they were going so fast that Sabriel could barely make out the ground below, and the individual islands of the delta merged into, a, into one continuous blur of motion. Eyes closed in protective slits, she craned her head around. The wind striking her face like a vicious slap. The pursuing gore crows were all over the sky now, formation lost, like small black stains against a red, purple, red and purple sunset. They were flapping uselessly, trying to come back together, but the paper wing was already a league or more away. There was no chance they would catch up. They could catch up. Sabriel let out a sigh of relief, but it was a sigh tempered with new anxieties. The wind was carrying them at a fearful, fearful pace, and it was starting to veer northwards, which it wasn't supposed to do. Sabriel could see the first stars twinkling now, and they were definitely turning towards the buckle. It was an effort to call up the charter marks again. The whistle 
and whistled a spell to ease the wind and turn it back to the east. But Sabriel managed to cast it, but the, fail, but the spell failed to work. The wind grew stronger and shifted more till they were careening straight towards the buckle directly north. Sabriel hunkered down in the cockpit, eyes and nose screaming and face frozen, tried again, using all of her willpower to force the charter marks into the wind. Even to her, her whistle sounded feeble, and the charter marks once again vanished into what was now what had now become a glaze gaze gay gale I'm sorry which had now become a gale. Sabriel realized she had totally lost control. In fact, it was almost as if the spell had the opposite effect. For the wind grew wilder, snatching the paper wing up and in a great spiral, like a ball thrown between a ring of giants, each one taller than the last. Sabriel grew dizzy and even colder, and her breath came fast and shallow, trying to salvage enough air to keep her alive. She tried to calm the winds again, but couldn't gain the breath to whistle, and the charter mark slipped from her mind till all she could do was desperately hang on to the straps of the hammock's seat as the paper wing tried its best to ride the storm. Then, without warning, the wind ceased its upward dance. It just dropped, and with it went the paper wing. Sabriel fell upwards, strapped suddenly tight, and Moggett almost clawed through the pack in an effort to stay connected with the aircraft. Jolted by this new development, Sabriel felt her exhaustion burn away. She tried to whistle the lifting wind, but it was too, but it too was beyond her power. The paper wing seemed unable to halt its headlong descent. It fell, nose tilting further and further forward till it was almost diving till it was diving almost vertically, like a hammer rushing to the anvil of the ground below. <clears throat> it was a long way down. Sabriel screamed once then tried to put some of her fear-found strength into the paper wing, but the marks flowed into her whistle without effect, save for her golden sparkle that briefly illuminated her white, fro white wind-frozen face. The sun had completely set, and the dark mass of the ground below looked all too much like the gray river of death. The river their spirits would cross into in a few short minutes, never to return to the warm light of life. Loosen my collar, mewed a voice at Sabriel's ear, followed by a curious sensation of Moggett's digging his of Moggett digging his claws into her armor as he clambered into her lap. Loose my collar. Sabriel looked at him, at the ground, at the collar. She felt stupid, starved of oxygen, unable to decide. The collar was part of an ancient binding, a terrible guardian of tremendous power. It would only be used to contain an inexpressible evil or uncontrollable force. Trust me, howled Moggett. Loose my collar and remember the ring. Sabriel swallowed, closed her eyes, fumbled with the collar and prayed that she was doing the right thing. Father, forgive me, she thought, but it was not just to her father that she had spoke, but to all the abhorsons who had come before her especially the one who had made the collar so, so long ago. Surprisingly, for such an ancient spell, she felt little more 
then pins and needles at the collar came free as the collar came free then it was open and suddenly heavy like a lead rope or a ball and chain Sabriel almost dropped it but it became light again then it's insubstantial when Sabriel opened her eyes the collar had simply ceased to exist Moggett sat still on her lap <clears throat> Moggett sat still on her lap and seemed unchanged then he seemed to glow with an internal light and expand till, she, till he became frayed at the edges and the light grew and grew within a few seconds there was no cat shape left just a shining blur too bright to look at it seemed to hesitate for a moment and Sabriel felt its attention flicker between aggression towards her and some inner struggle it almost formed back into the cat shape again then suddenly split into four shafts of brilliant white one shot forward one aft and the two seemed to slide into the wings then the whole paper wing shone with fierce bright white brilliance and it abruptly stopped its headlong dive and leveled out Sabriel was flung violently forward body checked by straps but her her nose almost hit the silver mirror neck muscles cording out with an impossible effort to keep her head still despite this sudden improvement they were still falling Sabriel hands now clasped behind her savagely aching neck saw the ground rushing up to the horizon up to fill the horizon <clears throat> treetops suddenly appeared below the paper wing imbued with the strange light just clipping through the upper branches with a sound like hail on a tin roof then they dropped again skimming scant yards above what looked like a cleared field but still too fast to land without total destruction Moggett or whatever Moggett had become breaked breaked the paper wing again in a series of shuddering halts that appeared that added bruises on top of bruises for the first time Sabriel felt an incredible relief of knowing that they would survive one more breaking effort and the paper wing would be safely down to skid a little in a long soft grass of a of the field <clears throat> Moggett Moggett braked and Sabriel cheered as the paper wing gently lay its belly on the grass and slid to what should have been a perfect landing but the cheer suddenly became a shriek of alarm as the grass parted to reveal a lip of an enormous dark hole directly in their path too low to rise and now too slow to glide over the hole at least 50 yards across the paper wing reached the edge flipped over and spiraled towards the bottom of the hole hundreds of feet below <clears throat> <clears throat> 